Uh, good evening. My name is Chris Kerr. I'm the executive director of the Ignatian Solidarity Network. And on behalf of our board of directors and our staff, it's an um, honor to have all of you here with us tonight. Um, I, in a second, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, the work of ISN. But I'd like to welcome uh, Jesuit Father Mick McCarthy up to offer an opening prayer. Mick. Thank you, Chris, both for being here uh, and for inviting everybody here, uh, and also for the great work that you do in the Ignatian Solidarity Network, which in so many respects is an inspiration to all of us. So he's asked me to, um, to lead us in just an opening prayer, and uh, I, I thought what I would do is I would read a blessing from uh, a fellow by the name of John O'Donohue for peace. As the fever of the day calms toward twilight, May all that is strained in us come to ease. We pray for all who suffered violence today. May an unexpected serenity surprise them. For those who risk their lives each day for peace, may their hearts glimpse providence at the heart of history. That those who make riches from violence and war might hear in their dreams the cries of the lost that we might see through our fear of each other a new vision to heal our fatal attraction to aggression, that those who enjoy the privilege of peace might not forget their tormented brothers and sisters, that the wolf might lie down with the lamb, that our swords be beaten into plowshares, and no hurt or harm be done anywhere along the holy mountain. So let us pray. Loving God, send upon us this blessing of peace. And on this night that we honor Kevin and Trina, send into us the spirit of rejoicing and gratitude for them. Instill in us the love of justice and deepen our solidarity with all those you love. In your holy name we pray, amen. Thanks, Mick. Um, I think the, the theme of gratitude in that prayer is a great way to think about tonight. Um, I just want to express, uh, you know, I think we're all here to express our gratitude for the work of Kevin and Trina. Um, but I also want to express uh, gratitude to each of you for being here to celebrate uh, their work and their, their ministry. Um, it's a real honor to have each of you. Many of you are here because you've come to know them through uh, their time in El Salvador or even before. Some of you are here because you've come to know them through Santa Clara, either as a colleague or as a, a student, um, or through the CASA program as well. Some of you have come here because you've come to know the work of ISN. And I hope that you will um, keep, keep going with all three of those and, and that we can find ways to, to continue to bring those three together. So really grateful to you uh, for being here. Also really grateful to uh, Santa Clara and specifically to Father Ang, uh, the president of Santa Clara University for uh, being, I have to say, being extremely excited about this opportunity to recognize Kevin and Trina and, um, and for, from the get-go, being uh, very uh, supportive in uh, making sure that this event happened here at Santa Clara and making sure that it, it was such a wonderful um, event in terms of the wonderful food and drink. And I know he's very upset he can't be here tonight. We, we worked around his schedule to, to uh, make sure that he could be here and then something uh, change that was out of uh, his control, and we'll get a chance to, uh, he'll join us kind of uh, via video, not live, but via video. He'll, he'll give you the backstory on that in a little bit. So, but know that, uh, Kevin and Trina know that he's um, very excited for you both, and, um, and, and hopefully it, it shows in, in many ways, and so we'll, um, we'll get to see that in a little bit. So, and thanks too to the Ignatian Center uh, for their help, and to uh, Mick, and to Michael Nuttall for uh, all the work that your staff did uh, to help make tonight possible as well, and also to uh, Clara uh, at the Casa in El Salvador for all the work that she did uh, there to help us to make some of the, the video and, and kind of uh, photo elements. Uh, we couldn't have done it without Clara, so please let her know uh, that when you see her soon. Um, for some of you, you're, you may not be familiar with the Ignatian Solidarity Network. We are a national social justice education and advocacy network inspired by the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola. We celebrated our 10th anniversary this past year. We work primarily with uh, institutions sponsored by the Jesuits, universities like Santa Clara, 
high schools, parishes, and other ministries. And with those people that are affiliated with those institutions, that can include students, faculty, staff, alumni, parishioners, uh, current and former Jesuit volunteers, um, and, and lots of other folks that have a connection to the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola. And we, and we, uh, we, do, we, we work to help people uh, more deeply understand issues of injustice and find ways to advocate and especially find ways to work together. Um, so what's exciting about this event tonight is to have so many different parts of uh, the Ignatian Jesuit world come together in one space. And, and I, as I think about the, the many kind of cross uh, connections that exist in this room, it's really, it's really unique, it's really special. So again, thank you for being here. Our organization started, uh, while we celebrate our 10th anniversary, our organization really started over 15 years ago. Uh, many of you may, may be familiar with the Ignatian Family Teaching for Justice. Uh, this is a gathering that initially started on the uh, banks of the Chattahoochee River in Columbus, Georgia, in southwest Georgia, um, as a part of the uh, vigils to call attention to the U.S. Army School of the Americas and the training of uh, Latin American soldiers that was taking place there, including the soldiers who, uh, many of the soldiers who were a part of the murders of the six Jesuits in Elba and Salina, as well as Archbishop Oscar Romero, excuse me, blessed Archbishop Oscar Romero, as well as the four uh, church women, Dorothy Kazel, Edith Ford, Maura Clark, and Jean Donovan. Um, Bob Holstein, one of our, what I call, founding fathers, uh, was a former California province Jesuit, and he uh, was very moved by the deaths of the Jesuits in Selena and Elba. Uh, so moved that after a year or two of going to the gates of Fort Benning, where the School of the Americas, uh, now known under a, a different, longer, complicated name, um, uh, after a couple of years, he actually was arrested and spent a number of months in federal prison uh, for uh, civil disobedience, uh, trying to call attention to the role of the school in U.S. foreign policy in El Salvador and, and throughout the region. Uh, Bob had this vision to, uh, to take that to be much bigger, and so he has started gathering people. He said, let's gather people in the context of, of this Jesuit network. Let's bring people together at the gates of Fort Benning. And so... Um, he did, he started a teach-in. It started as just a, a, a small group of people gathering for mass uh, during the weekend and turned into a couple hundred folks gathering under a tent. Uh, come rain, snow, sleet, whatever the weather. Well, there, there wasn't snow maybe in Southern Georgia, but it was really cold one year, let me tell you, and muddy, very muddy. And so, and that tent grew to be bigger and bigger. And um, the teach-in now is uh, really one of the largest Catholic social justice gatherings in the country each year. Um, that has incorporated legislative advocacy, a broader range of issues. Um, and our symbol, our symbol is the tent. And that was because of those initial gatherings under that, uh, under that tent on the banks of the Chattahoochee. And Bob's idea with that was that it could be a place where people could gather that could grow. The tent can, as we see, the tents are getting bigger outside for a reunion weekend here. The tents can always grow. But it was also a place that people could gather, not just in Georgia. And so the tent, uh, it, it uh, you know, gets stood up all over the place. It's here tonight. We're we're in that we're in the tent tonight, and it uh, it appears in Washington D.C. and it appears when people. Uh, this past summer, we had folks who are part of Jesuit parishes engaged in social justice work gather. We had high school students, we had university students, staff at universities, and people come together in lots of different contexts to talk about their work for justice, talk about how they can collaborate, and um, understand issues more, and advocate. On, on a variety of issues, including continuing to work on human rights in Central America. So I want you to know by being here tonight, you're part of that tent, and uh, we're so glad to have you as part of, of the Ignatian family. So uh, thank you again. I'd like to uh, begin our uh, reflections on, on Kevin and Trina as we prepare to honor them with the Legacy of the Martyrs Award. Um, I want to say that the award, this will be the fourth um, group or set of individuals to be honored. Representative Jim McGovern, uh, a congressman from Massachusetts who was very involved with the U.S. congressional investigation into the murders of the Jesuits and uh, Selena and Elba uh, was honored. Uh, Jesuit Honduran uh, Human Rights Ministry uh, was recognized. The Kino Border Initiative, which is a Jesuit run uh, 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 ministry for uh, immigrants on the U.S.-Mexico border was recognized. Uh, this past spring, 
And now we're excited to recognize Kevin and Trina tonight. So we have a number of folks who are going to offer some reflections on, on who they are. And we're going to begin first uh, with Father Ang, who, as I told you, can't be with us here tonight, but is joining us via, via video. And so we'll begin uh, with Father Ang. Good evening, everyone. Bienvenidos. I wish I could be with all of you tonight to honor Kevin and Trina, but I'm attending a two-day out-of-town meeting. I do want to express my congratulations to Kevin and Trina for receiving the Ignatian Solidarity Network Legacy of the Martyrs Award. For my part, I want to say how proud Santa Clara University is for what Kevin and Trina have done with the CASA program in El Salvador. Kevin and Trina both realized years ago that real transformation comes through authentic accompaniment. The genius of the CASA program lies in the way our students are changed for the rest of their lives by relationships with people who suffer most. And truly, that's what the martyrs understood and lived. More than anything else, the students who have come through the CASA program are Trina and Kevin's greatest legacy. I'm certain that Kevin and Trina feel immense pride in who our students have become. On every one of my visits to El Salvador, I've been deeply touched. I was honored to participate in last year's 15th anniversary celebration of the CASA program. Sitting in the park, listening to the testimonials of so many community partners was a truly moving experience. I vividly remember speaking with members of the Quintanilla family about their long-term relationship with Kevin and Trina and the CASA program. This is just one example of the profound relationships that Trina and Kevin have formulated. It reminded me just how important the CASA is for Santa Clara, for Salvadoran partners, and for Jesuit higher education. Let me take this opportunity to thank and congratulate Chris Kerr. Chris, you and the Ignatian Solidarity Network have promoted leadership and advocacy among people throughout Jesuit works. I'm grateful that you have given Santa Clara the honor of hosting tonight's celebration. To Kevin and Trina, Thank you and felicidades for everything you have done for the CASA, for Santa Clara University, and for Jesuit education. The legacy of the Martyrs Award is a fitting tribute to your great work. I know many CASA alums are with you at the Adobe Lodge tonight, and I trust you want to get back to that party. So God bless you, Kevin and Trina, as well as your wonderful family. Enjoy the celebration, and for me, sing one more round of CASA Abierta. was great. Um, next, I'd like to invite Sullivan Oakley. Sullivan is a CASA alum. And I think it's, uh, was it 2009? Uh, she told me, nine, 2009. And then she worked with the CASA program for a number of years after that, including both in El Salvador and in the Philippines. And uh, Sullivan's going to come up and offer some reflections from her perspective of knowing Kevin and Trina both as a student, but also as a colleague. Sullivan. I can't quite go off the cuff like Chris does. He's much more poised than I am, but he knows that. So as you mentioned, my name is Sullivan, um, and he said sort of what my relationship with the CASA and Kevin and Trina is. Um, and it's really work which has meant so much to my life. So I can't tell you what a privilege it is to be here with all of you this evening, and what a joy it is to honor these two individuals, and really this whole family sitting over here, who have each shaped my life in such profound ways. Tonight, we're here to honor Kevin and Trina and to honor the incredible and innovative work to which they have dedicated their lives. I wish we could hear from all the alums in the room because I know that each has his or her own story to tell or gratitude to express. So I can only say that I will try to do this justice. But when I began my reflections on um, beginning to write this on my experiences in El Salvador and my experiences working and living alongside with Kevin and Trina, a very vivid image came to my mind. And it was a place that I found myself many times. It was an image of sitting around their kitchen table in El Salvador. I have so many memories of sitting there with the two of you and with Sophie and Gracie and Hannah and Emma. Memories of talking and laughing but also really memories of dreaming. We've spent some time at that kitchen table <laughs> dreaming about the future, whether it was yours or my own, and all of the things that that future could hold. 
dreams for the program, for your family, for our lives. And as this image came to me, I remembered so many of the stories I had heard in El Salvador about dreams. In a few moments in the video, we'll hear Lupita, one of the Casa Cooks, describe in such beautiful words the dreams of the martyrs. Their dream, she says, which Kevin and Trina are keeping alive, was to never abandon the communities. As I thought about this image of dreaming and this beautiful image which Lupita describes so beautifully, I thought about the martyrs' dreams. I thought about the dreams of Ignacio Ejacuria, of what a Jesuit university could be. That is, a transformative and liberating force in the world. And I was brought back to the stories of the very dreams on which CASA was founded and on which it grew to be what it is today. Dean Brackley's dreams, and yours, Steve, and Sonny, and Kevin, and Trina, and yours, Mark, and so many of, of the other people that are sitting in this room. And although I was not there that evening, I had this image in my mind of all of you sitting around a table at the Papusaria, dreaming this program into existence. And it is your dreams and the risks that you've taken along the way that have created this incredible thing that we call the CASA. Your dreams and your dedication with our amazing Salvadoran partners and the supporters and champions of the CASA program at our Jesuit institutions, all of this has created the opportunity for me and for so many others to look more deeply at the reality of our world, to touch that reality with our own two hands and to let it permeate every fiber of our being and from there to work for the kingdom of God. I can say that it's joy, I promise. <laughs> that, I, that I've become a better and deeper version of myself. And I've witnessed this same deepening in so many others because of this model that you've created and lived for the past 16 years. And for that, we are so deeply grateful. Another voice that we'll hear in a moment was also mentioned already, um, is that of Christina Quintanilla, which might be a familiar name to some in the room, very exuberant woman and very strong. And she's one of the Praxis Site community coordinators in a community called San Antonio Abad. And in the video, she talks about the big love of the martyrs. And as we all know, that was a love which took great risks. I'd love to just take a moment and touch on some of the ways in which I have seen Trina and Kevin pass along this big love of the martyrs. To be honest, there's no experience quite like being in our Salvadoran Praxis communities with Trina. When you walk into a community with her, you can sort of see and feel this whole world light up inside of her. And you can see it in the Salvadorans, too. The love and the care and the dedication that she has for our Salvadoran partners, and vice versa, is truly a stunning sight to see. I was reflecting on a moment recently when I was in Tepecoyo, one of our Praxis sites, with Trina. And this image came to me of the way that she greeted these two particular women in the community, Angelica and Daisy. And I remember watching her greet them and feeling in the very core of my being this, this bond that existed between she and these women and the comfort that they seemed to feel in one another's presence. This memory has stayed with me in a very profound way. Trina, your ability to greet these women, to hold all of the memories and the moments that they've shared with you and your attentiveness to their lives and their stories amazed me that day. I feel like you're a storehouse of these memories. And I cherish the moments when I've gotten the privilege to sit with you and members of our Praxis communities, remembering, laughing, sometimes crying. They feel so loved by you, Trina. And I hope that you know in every moment how deeply loved that you are by them. 
And Kevin, the memory that came to me for you was last April. I was visiting El Salvador, and you had decided to make burritos for all of the Bacadios, our Salvadoran scholarship students. And I remember um, I was coming over for dinner that night, and I remember walking into the house and seeing Kevin in all his exuberance. You were finishing the cooking and sort of chatting with each Bacadio and welcoming in people as they came. And I remember you gave me this huge welcome and you made sure that everyone at the table knew who I was and introduced me to all the new Salvadoran scholarship students. And I just remember thinking, this is Kev. You have this sort of perpetual reaching out towards others, this deep and real desire to include everyone at the table. You're always looking to expand the community, to make the family bigger, and to welcome in everyone that we can. Your work to expand the network, to connect people to one another, and to build community always and everywhere, these are some of the ways that you spread that big love of the martyrs that Christina Quintanilla was talking about. There's a song that we sing at the Casa before all our meals. Vamos todos al banquete. Everyone come to the table or to the banquet. And Kevin, you embody this in all that you do. You make sure that everyone's invited to the banquet and you make sure that we all know each other once we arrive. And finally, just to the both of you, I have to end with the mention of some of the greatest love of all. And that is the way that you love these four beautiful women that are with us here tonight. The way that you love and have raised Sophia and Gracie and Hannah and Emma gives us an incredible model for what love and family can look like in the world. Kevin and Trina, thank you for all of the ways in which you pass along that expansive love of the martyrs. Your dreams have helped fulfill theirs. Thank you for letting us be a part of those dreams. And thank you for letting us be a part of all of those risks that you had to take along the way. Knowing you has been one of the greatest gifts. And I cannot tell you what it's meant to me or to all of us to be just a small part of this incredible program. Thank you. Thank you, Sullivan. And just, just out of curiosity, how many CASA alums do we have in the room tonight? Raise your hands. Wow. Look at all of them. All right. Moving along. That was great, Sullivan. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Father Steve Prevett. Uh, Father Prevett, as, as you heard from Sullivan, was, was part of the... Um, coming up with this uh, idea of CASA and hired Kevin and Trina during his time at Santa Clara as provost, and then moved on to, to University of San Francisco as president, and now uh, has the role of chancellor, and also a number of roles within the province, uh, the California province, the Jesuits. And, but his most important title is, of course, he's a member of the board of directors of the Ignatian Solidarity Network. So <laughs> well, that's, but, but Steve, please come on up. Thank you. So I want to flash back 17 years, I think, Pupuseria Pati, in Planes de Renderos. So I was at this god-awful board meeting. <laughs> and Dean Brackley said, we have, I, there's this couple in Belize working for International JBC. They would be terrific for this program. I said, great. Schedule the meeting for five o'clock so I do not have to go to the evening session of this board. <laughs> and they bailed me out. And you know what we did at Dean Brackley, who was really the genius behind all of this, and I had dinner with them, and we gave them kind of a concept, a rough concept. I think the best analogy, it's like handing somebody a lump of clay and saying, can you make this thing fly? And in a year, you have a 737 that's just <laughs> flawless. I mean, they took this concept and they made it work. They are the ones who did CASA. 
There are people here in the room who worked with them. I'm thinking of Barbara and Dennis, and then later Mark and Sonny. But these are the folks who put it together. And in my mind, what they put together was the quintessential Jesuit educational experience, a completely integrated learning experience. It involved learning. It involved living simply together in community, gave students the tools to live meaningful and purposeful lives, spirituality, and finally, the accompaniment with the marginalized. That alone, I think, puts them in the pantheon of Jesuit educators. And the beginning, this was all the pre hagues era. This is the pre-Hannah, Emma, Grace, and Sophie. And as Sullivan pointed out, what should not get lost is while they were developing this incredible program, they also developed an incredible family. And when I was there for the beatification of Monsignor Romero, Sophia insisted that she wanted to spend, and it was the quintessential dark and rainy night, and she wanted to spend it on the streets of El Salvador with all these folks who were, and they had these negotiations. It was driving me crazy. <laughs> I was saying, just tell the kid no. <laughs> and there were cell phones and this and that and went on and on and on. This was a genuine discernment. This was not a decision. But the end result was that Sophie stayed in the streets on this dark and rainy night. But what was illustrative for me was the care and the deliberation that went into the decision and the fact that Sophie was taken seriously. This was weighed and they jointly made a decision and that's really the way the program runs. And that same sensitivity, that same care filters through the entire program and nowhere is that more in evidence than when you visit a Praxis site. And when you talk with the person at the Praxis site, you can feel the pride, you can feel the ownership that they have for the program. When you talk to the women who prepare the food, you can feel the pride, you can sense the ownership that they have for the program because they have been dealt with respectfully and with dignity. And their participation in this program has made them stronger, better people, as it has everybody who was associated with the program. So tonight, we celebrate with you the program and the family and your relationship. All three of those are well deserving of celebration, and I am delighted to be able to be a part of this this evening. So thank all of you, and thank you kids for putting up with them, huh? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Steve. And now we have, uh, Sullivan referenced this, but we have a chance to hear from uh, some Salvadoran partners. I'd like to invite up Michael Nuttall from the Ignatian Center to give a little context to the video we're going to see. Thanks, Chris. Uh, another Casa alum, so just add it to the list. Um, it's, so it's a real honor to, to be here tonight. Uh, as for those of you who know Kevin Trina, which is probably everyone in the room, this will not come as a surprise, but uh, as soon as we started talking about the event for tonight, the very first question and concern for them was, how can we incorporate our wonderful extended family in El Salvador here uh, tonight? We ran into some logistical issues of bringing every Praxis partner here to Santa Clara tonight. <laughs> Though, frankly, if Kevin and Trina were really dictating the terms, that is exactly what would have occurred. Um, so after some of that negotiation and discernment, uh, we were able to put together a very short, sort of simple video, um, really to be able to ask uh, the partners a particular question that Kevin and Trina worked on. And, and once again, uh, Kevin and Trina, unsurprisingly, tried to make it not about them. Uh, and so the biggest testament to Kevin and Trina, as we talked about, is really this program, their family, and it's about the other. 
um, and about how they connect with that other uh, in so many different ways. And so what this is really about is as we take the memory of the martyrs and think about what that means, how does the CASA and through the CASA sort of Kevin and Trina represent and live out the legacy of that martyrs here today? So we wanted to be able to put that question to some of our partners in El Salvador and see what they could say. Sí, considero que el, la Casa de la Solidaridad y, y a través del trabajo de Kevin y Trina ha hecho que el legado de los mártires continúe trayendo a los estudiantes a las comunidades y de esa manera los estudiantes poder tener un contacto más directo con la gente pobre, con la gente allá en las comunidades, trabajando en una manera organizativa y los estudiantes en una manera están aprendiendo de, del trabajo que cada comunidad realiza. El ejemplo que los ha dejado los mártires creo que es como eso que los estudiantes van a las comunidades, así como ellos iban allá a las comunidades. El acompañamiento que el programa de la casa hace en las comunidades es exactamente el sueño que tenía Ignacio de Acuría, ¿verdad? Que el pueblo haga oír su voz, ¿verdad? Y eso es lo que continúa haciendo Fundación Santa Clara a través del programa de la Casa de la Solidaridad. Y yo sí considero que los estudiantes acá en la casa y por supuesto que y Trina están siempre luchando para que el sueño que tenía el Padre Dean con el Padre Esteban y otros de no abandonar a las comunidades eso siempre se está haciendo porque a mí me consta cuando hemos también visitado las comunidades y la gente se siente realizada cuando aprenden algo diferente. Entonces, yo sí considero que, aunque sea un poquito, pero el legado de ellos continúa. La solidaridad que ellos dan a las comunidades, a la gente, el amor, el cariño, todo eso, pues, hacen como en momentos difíciles, como una no sé cómo sentirse fortalecido uno a través de, de la Casa de la Solidaridad, saber que hay alguien allí que está como más como pendiente de las comunidades y pues se siente uno bien. Bueno, el logrado de los mártires para mí es como... Es tan importante, ¿verdad? Porque creo que las nuevas generaciones van aprendiendo este, la historia, la historia de nuestros mártires, la historia de nuestro pueblo, la historia del país, donde tanta gente sufrió y tanta gente por la justicia social. Y creo que el aporte que nosotros damos a la casa es de esa historia, ¿verdad? De la historia de la guerra, de la historia de del pueblo y que también las nuevas generaciones sepan que, que en este mundo se ha sufrido pero también hay esperanza. Para mí el programa de la Casa de la Solidaridad tiene muchos rasgos que fueron importantes en la vida de los mártires. Eh, uno de ellos es el contacto con la realidad de las comunidades pobres. Para los mártires la opción por los pobres era clave y quisieron que la Universidad Centroamericana hiciera esta opción de una manera bien explícita, pero a la vez ellos mantuvieron una relación muy cercana con comunidades pobres. Entonces en las comunidades de praxis yo creo que este programa eh, pone en práctica ese legado de los mártires. También en todo el tema de la preocupación y el conocimiento de la realidad y la construcción de una realidad más justa. Una realidad más justa que no solamente es a nivel del Salvador, sino a nivel internacional. Entonces el hecho de que estudiantes eh, de las universidades norteamericanas puedan conocer la realidad del Salvador, puedan ver las diferencias importantes entre la sociedad norteamericana 
y la sociedad salvadoreña y, y descubrir cuáles son las causas de esta situación tan desigual, tan inequitativa y que se debe pues a la injusticia que reina a nivel mundial, creo que también es algo muy vinculado al legado de los mártires. Yo creo que el sentido en sí de la casa es trasladarnos, transmitirnos ese gran amor que los estudiantes, ¿verdad? Ese gran amor que los mártires tenían para con nosotros, ¿verdad? Y en especial Trina y Kevin quieren trasladar ese amor por medio de los estudiantes, ¿verdad? Y aplicarlo también, ¿verdad? El amar y el compartir de ellos. So we've made our case for why we should honor Kevin and Trina. What do you think? Do they, have they earned it? Yeah? I'd like to invite um, Robin Caponi, who's the vice chair of our board of directors, to, to come up. Robin is not only um, uh, a member of our board and, and very involved with the work of uh, ISN and a great supporter of ISN, but Robin is also a uh, CASA alum parent and can offer us a little perspective as she presents the award. Yeah, my husband and I spent Thanksgiving 2006 with your family. There were only three girls then, yes. <laughs> and um, then our daughter Kara went on um, to JVC and but had a wonderful experience, and we experienced a wonderful Thanksgiving and hospitality with you that year. So I'm just very happy to be here to represent the board and the um, other members of the ISN. I think for, I speak for Trina uh, to just kind of share that we are really uh, humbled by uh, this event, um, by your presence here, um, and we accept the award with great humility, um, really on behalf of all of our Salvadoran partners. Um, Yeah, it's, it's just really moving, you know, to, to, I mean, people that we love so dearly to be sharing um, and to be here with the girls. As we were reflecting over our thoughts uh, and what we were going to share this evening, the part that struck me the most was when I was referring to the girls in relation to um, our time in El Salvador. Um, so I don't know. We want to, okay, I'm going to stick to my notes because otherwise I'm not going to, Mark, Mark was, Mark was saying, go with like Pope Francis and like leave the notes. I'm going to stick to the notes now, okay. Um, so, <laughs> we want to thank um, Chris Kerr and the board of the Ignatian Solidarity Network. As many of you know, the work that they do with the limited resources that they have is really amazing in bringing together people across the Ignatian family. Um, it's really inspiring, and so we're grateful and, uh, you know, for, for honoring with us with this, with this award. 
Um, also, as Chris mentioned, you know, thanking Father Ang and the President's Office, as well as Mick and Mike Nuttle and the folks in the Ignatian Center for really pulling this all together and allowing us to gather in, in this way. So we're very grateful. And certainly grateful um, to all of you who shared such, such kind words, you know. Um, and also, it was great to incorporate our Salvadoran friends. Um, you're up now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really, it's just, um, it's such a privilege to be here with all of you um, and to share in this. And, you know, earlier today, I was really nervous um, to, to do this and thought, oh, I'm going to speak in Spanish because I don't get as nervous in Spanish. But, um, but I, I just, recognizing once we started, that this really, it's just not about us. It's about the work of the Casa. It's about the Salvadorans. And it's just um, a privilege to be here. Um, so we want to continue with some more words of thanks. We want to thank, with, with the, our deepest gratitude, to Steve Prevet, to Sunny Manuel, or Sunny, or Sunny City, to Mark Ravisa. Um, we want to thank Dennis Gordon and Barbara Collier um, for being an incredible team in the early years of the Casa. And really, without you all and your support, we would not be here today. Thank you for teaching us what it means to be people of service and people of love in the world. Um, we also want to thank our current team in the study abroad office, specifically David Wick and Paul Sukup for your support um, in, our, in our weekly meetings that we have on Tuesday morning to feel more to connected to Santa Clara. So to thank the two of you for the support that you give to us now. It's also really moving to see so many alums. Um, so to thank all of you for making the time to, to come and, and gather this evening. Um, when we do gather, um, it really is an opportunity for Trina and I to, to maintain a connectedness with you. And it's moving, you know, as I get older, I appreciate more and more kind of like the spirit of young people being committed in this world in your different vocations. Um, so thank you for coming tonight. And for those of you who are able, if you want to hang around afterwards, we're going to have some avisos in the back. So. <laughs> uh, we want to take a moment to thank our family for supporting us. And I think it's safe to say that they have not always understood us, um, but, they, but they really have loved us unconditionally over the years. We want to thank, in particular, my sister Talise, who is here tonight, but who has visited us numerous times in El Salvador. My mom, Pat, who came in late last night from Michigan. To Kevin's cousin, Matt, and his wife, Rula, and their new baby, who are back there with the, the iPad. Um, and Kevin's parents, who are with us via, via Skype. Um, but to thank you for, for really your unconditional love and support. And to our daughters, to Sophia, Grace, Hannah, and Emma, to thank you for being companions on our journey. Thank you for, you really, you have been some of our best teachers of what it means to be people of faith, of what it means to be people of hope, and reminding us that it's important to laugh. So thank you for that. And we could not be more proud to be your parents. We're also grateful to be part of um, and want to recognize Casa Bayanihan. So we have two alums who have been successfully directing our sister program in the Philippines, Heidi Callen and Grace Carlson. Uh, Guillermo, Betsy, and Sully, who are here tonight, were also uh, part of both of our staffs in El Salvador and the Philippines. And just to give a, a shout out to our sister program there in the Philippines and the great work that they're doing. And we think probably the most important in the context of this award, our words of gratitude go to our partners in El Salvador. Um, and it's true, when we were talking about this event, we said, you know, we said, how can we get the Salvadorans there to be with us? But it, because it really is them. Um, so thank you for making that happen. And it was just, it was just a pure joy to see their faces and, and to hear them talk about the Casa and the work of the martyrs. Um, and they have really taught us what it means to rely on community, to collaborate for the reign of God. They've taught us what it means to trust in a God who truly yearns for a world that is more just and more humane. Um, and in the words of, we have a, we have a friend, Don Angel. He is an 84-year-old campesino 
um, from Chalate, who spent his younger years accompanying people, basically having a safe house between the conflict areas in Chalatenango and getting them to refugee camps in the city and, and the border countries. And now as he's aging in life, he really, he has a final message that he wants to leave with people. And whenever he gets the opportunity to share this message, he will do it even at Sophia's 15th birthday on Sunday. This was his message for Sophia at her mass. Um, but it really, I mean, this is, this I think embodies um, the gift that the Salvadorans have given to us. And he says, if you want to be happy in this life, he says, it's very simple. He says, follow the example of Jesus and be at the side of the poor. And that is what El Salvador continues to teach us. And we find great wisdom and tr great truth in that. We also want to remember two people who are very beloved friends to us who are not here with us this evening. People have mentioned Dean Brackley, who as many of you know, was one of um, the co-founder and, and inspiration of the CASA. We also want to remember Father Paul Locatelli, who also um, was very, very supportive, often visited us, and was very fond and very supportive of the Romero program. And, and they are very present to us this afternoon, and they continue to inspire us in the work that we do with the CASA. Our entire gathering today is really illuminated by the light of the Salvadoran martyrs. In referring to the legacy of the martyrs, John Sabrino draws on the parable of the Good Samaritan when he writes, to live truly and humanly in El Salvador inescapably means, as Jesus said in the parable, meeting up with a wounded person on the way. And they met one. But they did not meet up with an individual, but rather with an entire people. And not just with a wounded people, but rather a crucified people. And this meeting is where the human part is decided. Either you make a detour around them as the priest and the Levite of the parable did, or you heal his and her wounds or her wounds. Our martyrs made no detour. John goes on to say, in the presence of the crucified people, their hearts were moved and they were moved to mercy. They internalized the suffering of an entire people and responded to it. They were working to bring the crucified people down from the cross. As many of you know, the Casa began in 99 and was officially launched in Salvador on the 10th anniversary of the killings of the Jesuits and Elba and Selena. We remember very clearly Father Charlie Curry announcing to a packed auditorium at the UCA the launching of the CASA program. To this day, we continue to receive inspiration and hope from the lives and the commitments of the Salvadoran martyrs. Their witness continues to challenge all of us in higher education to ask ourselves, what are we doing to bring the crucified people down from the cross? I believe it is an important question and one that simultaneously highlights the urgency of our current situation and begs a response. When our students first come down to El Salvador, we spend a lot of time introducing them to the story of the Salvadoran martyrs, to people who have given their lives to the work for justice and solidarity. And we also ask the students why it is that they came to begin sharing with one another why, what it is that drew them to El Salvador. And Trina and I participate in that conversation. We share with the students why it is not only that we came, but why we continue to stay. And so Trina is going to share one little snippet of a story. So as many of you know, especially those of you who rose your hand having done the CASA, a big part of the culture of the CASA is home visits. Um, and a few months ago, I had the privilege of accompanying a few of our students to a woman's home in Tepecoyo. Tepecoyo has been mentioned a number of times this evening. Um, and we were visiting a woman named Rosario. So we went to, and Tepecoyo is about a 45 minute bus ride from the capital um, to, and it's a mountain village in the, in the coffee area of El Salvador. Um, Rosario, upon arrival at her house, much like most Salvadorans do, you know, welcomed us into her home. And really what her home consisted of was 
kind of rusted out sheet metal. She had, the only things she had in her house were um, kind of a rickety table and a few benches that were, that were collapsing and kind of broken. Um, but she invited us into her home and we sat on those benches hoping that they wouldn't break with, with everybody sitting on them. Um, and, she, and she quite quickly started sharing her story about her life. So at the age of eight, um, she never had the opportunity to go to school, and she started working at a very young age to provide for her younger brothers and sisters. Um, and she would sell vegetables and, and fruit in the street, basically anything that she could get her hands on, she'd walk through the streets of Tepecoyo to sell. Um, now Rosario is 64 years old. Some of you know her. My mom has met her. Um, she is 64 now and is, um, is very, very ill with diabetes. So there is a lot of loss in her life. She is, you know, her health is declining. She is losing her eyesight. She has lost the one job that she had to sustain her. Um, and most importantly, I think for her, she lost that freedom that she once had to walk through the streets of Tepecoyo. Um, and I think really selling the fruits and vegetables was secondary. I think it was really to get out and socialize and be with people was, was what she was doing. But was, what was really profound is, is no sooner was she sharing her, all of this about her story, she quickly went on to say, but I am so grateful to God. I am so grateful because even though I am losing my sight, I can still see where the treetops meet the sky. And I can see that. And you know who I'm talking about, too. Um, and she said, you know, now I can't afford to buy fruits and vegetables, but I still have the corn to grind to make the tortillas to eat. Um, so at the end of her visit, the one thing that she had kind of colorful in her home was that we call them cestas, but they're basically like plastic woven baskets. And she pulled that small cesta off from the wall, and out of it she pulled, there were six of us, and actually, there's a picture of her. If you go outside in the, in the foyer, the very first picture all the way to the left, there's a picture of Rosario. I, and, um, yeah. So she, she pulled on the cesta, and she pulled out six green mangoes, very small green mangoes, and she pulled out six very small, um, very ripe bananas. And she gave one of each to each one of us who was there with her. And one of the students leaned over to me and said, I don't think we should take these. Do we take these? And I said, we need to take these. Because what it means when we take these is we're saying yes to her life, and we're saying yes to her story. So fast forward about a week, and we were having a reflection with the CASA. Surprise, surprise, right? A reflection in the CASA. <laughs> and, um, and we were talking about different things. And one of the students who was on that visit, Brian, talked about that visit. And he said, you know, I, I grew up in the Christian tradition. And I have heard the story of Job over and over and over again. And he said, and now I understand that story of Job in a very different way. Accompanying Brian throughout the semester, um, and as, as many students do, he really engaged the reality of the Salvadoran people and continued to hear their stories, their stories of immense joy and their stories of immense suffering. But the incredible thing that happened, we, we talk about, and the martyrs talk about, taking people down off from their cross. And what we learned in the Casa, in, in this particular story with Brian, but again, we see this time and time again, that when we take the Salvadorans down from their cross, we actually take ourselves down from our crosses as well. Um, and Brian, through hearing these stories of the Salvadorans, he was able to begin to tap into his own story, his own story of immense joy, but also his, his story of immense suffering. And he had a community where he could do that, and he had a community where he felt safe to do that. Um, so, you know, the stories, we could go on, and I actually have many more stories tonight. We said, ah, oh, we gotta take that out, we gotta take that out, we gotta take that out. But, um, but that is, you know, to answer the question, why do we stay in El Salvador, and why are we part of the work of the CASA? Um, that's one story that, that shares with you all why we do the work that we do. We can't imagine for us a richer, more authentic way to live out our vocation, not only as educators, but as people of faith and of the parents of these four lovely children over here. 
Um, and we're just very grateful for your presence and for the support of Santa Clara to continue enabling us to do this work that we just find so life-giving. So thank you very much. Thank you.